Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, my name is Pamela Morris. I'm the vice dean here at the Steinhardt School. I guess I go in and out of. Try this. OK, everybody can hear. Or right, I'm just going to start just speaking loudly and hope that all works. Um, you know, it's so exciting to be here to launch the first in mm -hmm. our uh, new speaker series, the Leadership Lens series today. Um, it's very interesting to me. When Steinhardt first opened its doors back in 1890, it, we were the first school of education in an American university. Um, it, my sense is that even at that time, this is the kind of event, this is the kind of discussion that was envisioned. Back in 1890, our, our mission was to raise the status of teachers and to end the field of education. And the work at hand actually was to integrate, to think about how do we integrate kindergarten education into the K to 12 education system, uh, into the first to 12 education system. And what you can see by that is that we were always committed to uh, making a difference and to impact. But we recognized even back then that there were two key ingredients to making this all work and affecting change. The first was our need to expand our disciplinary expertise. So uh, we recognize then and now that uh, disciplinary silos would only limit the, the opportunities, would limit our ability to make traction on the kinds of things that we're facing our schools, but also our communities. And so while we started a school that was focused very much on pedagogy and kindergarten edu education, we added over the last century all of the fields that make up the 11 departments that are Steinhardt. And that is art and music and the social sciences, applied psychology where I'm in, media and communication and all the way over to the health fields. Rarely do you find all of these fields together in a single school, in a single place, and also all outwardly focused on working together to affect change and, uh, and um, make impact. And secondly, we realized that we needed to leverage rather than uh, uh, be hurt by our urban design and really partnering with agencies. So we didn't want to be a big school that was behind gates. You all walked in here through the street. And frankly, that's the way most of the NYU buildings are. We are really intertwined with the city. And we try to live up to that, that ecology, that, that design, by being truly in and of the city. Uh, we conduct work, um, like today, engaging with thought leaders. Um, uh, and this is emblematic of much of the work that's going on around Steinhardt. Um, and we've now successfully embedded these ingredients into Steinhardt's D DNA, and I'm going to tell you a few key examples. So yesterday I was at a, um, a big summit, actually, of our food studies faculty, who were working with nonprofits and restaurant owners, with uh, farmers, with policy leaders, to address the global challenge of food waste. Uh, we have music technology faculty who are working with city agencies in the 311 system to address noise pollution across the city. And much more apropos of today's conversation, we have education policy faculty who are partnering with school districts to think about how to embed maker spaces as spaces for science learning in K-12 schools. So today we bring together, we in that same model, bring together thought leaders with complementary perspectives to discuss issues of education and workforce policy. Now, I actually studied workforce policy for many years, actually coming at it from the perspective of children's development, not sort of a common theme at the time, and recognizing that as a developmental psychologist, I, wasn't, I didn't know enough about how families were making their money or the difference that income would make for kids. And you can imagine the needs to bring these two worlds together uh, in the service of those most at risk and to therefore help uh, those individuals navigate the higher education system ultimately for success uh, in the labor market. The, the notion is how can we make sure that education policy on the one hand and workforce policy on the other are actually working together synergistically and aligned rather than at odds as they often are to meet the needs of our most at-risk youth and families. So in short, I call all of this trying to put science to work. Um, you know, this is the model, several years ago I read um, a wonderful book about the Bell Labs experience. So this was over on, for many of you know, uh, many uh, decades ago. Um, the Bell Labs was really a model, an incubator for new ideas that were trying to solve the problem at the time of trying to get the East Coast to talk to the West Coast on the telephone. 
right? And what they did was they built a set of buildings where physicists and mathematicians and engineers and communications folks and salespeople ultimately would actually bump into each other. If you read this work, it's fascinating the ways in which they built an ecology where people would purposely share ideas and integrate those ideas together to solve problems together, and they did. They solved the problem of cross-national communication at the time. And today we try to do the same kind of thing, bring together thought leaders to, bring, to address some of the major challenges today, uh, education pipelines and career success. You know, um, challenge, notions like uh, conducting work at scale and interdisciplinary teams and partnerships with thought leaders uh, and with city agencies are not always necessarily synonymous with great universities or leading academics. Um, it requires taking risks, it requires a huge amount of courage, it requires an openness to new thinking and new ideas, new ways of doing work, and, a, and frankly, a, a humility that we don't have all the answers in academia. In fact, we probably don't have most of the answers in academia, but recognizing that it is the partnership is where the action is and the partnership is key to making a difference. But it's events like this one that, that remind us that it is that collaboration of academics, policy leaders, uh, thought leaders that allow us to affect change. So thank you so much for being here today, for joining in with us in this conversation. We're very excited to roll up our sleeves and, and join you in all of this critical discussion. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce Cynthia Rivera Weissbloom, who's president and CEO of the Edwin Gould Foundation. They were a key partner at, today, at today's event, and we are very grateful for all their support. Um, Cynthia has been committed to mitigating the obstacles of college success among low-income students for a long time. She's um, informed, what I love about her work is she's informed both the policy side of this issue as well as the practice side. And rarely do we have folks that actually cross both of those system levels, so to speak. At Edwin Gould, she's helped them deliver on their central mission, investing in organizations that help low-income students get to and through college, but has also expanded their work to expanded their efforts to be both not only a supporter of those organizations, but also an incubator uh, of, of new ones. She serves on a, a number of leading boards, uh, including Philanthropy New York and Europe, among others. And prior to joining Edwin Gould, she served as the director of the New York State Mentoring Program and CEO of Sponsors for Educational Opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Cynthia. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Thank you so much. And to Dean Brewer, to Dr. Anderson, um, to Dr. Nieves and the entire team at NYU Steinhardt who worked so hard, hard to organize this event. Also, welcome to our esteemed panelists. We're so lucky to have you here this afternoon to share your insights and to welcome our guests. It's going to be a fascinating discussion. As Dr. Morris said, the Edwin Gould Foundation operates the premier residential incubator for education nonprofits. We incubate organizations, we support those leaders in addressing their vision, their solutions to address the achievement and the opportunity gap. When you all come to visit us at the Edwin Gould Accelerator, which I hope you will, you will learn from our leaders about their innovative strategies and how our foundation supports them, relieving them of their rent and infrastructure costs while providing customized management consulting services for up to five years. So like many, so many of you were in this room, we see that the higher, higher education is at a particularly dynamic moment. We are all rethinking the value of higher education and reframing the outcomes we want for those who pursue two and four year degrees. We are also thinking about what the workforce of tomorrow might look like and how to prepare young people for success. That's our responsibility. We are here today to cut through the heightened rhetoric around this discussion. College is still worthwhile, and despite automation and rapidly advancing technology, tomorrow's workplace will still require students to think critically and to express themselves clearly. We will work, work will, 
still require stability, stamina, and focus. Young people in the workplace will still require role models and mentors and coaches to advocate their advancement. But some things will be different. Today, we are here to dig into the nuances of the conversation about education and the workforce. Insight provided by some of the most thoughtful and wise people in the field. And with that, it is my great honor to introduce one of the Edwin Gould Foundation strategic partners here at NYU Steinhardt, Dr. Noel Anderson, chairperson of the Department of Administration, Leadership, and Technology. And we're so grateful to be partners with you. Um, we've had a long history, and we have a bright future. I think uh, Cindy's the only person who can make this black man blush. So, uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you, Cindy. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Pamela. Thanks, everyone in this room, for being here tonight. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing this incredible discussion. Uh, so, really, um, I think um, what excites me is to see this room filled with leaders, students, everyone who's really concerned about these issues, as, as Pamela highlighted. And um, to be able to have a discussion like this with leaders, as been mentioned, who are incredible in leading this work in both policy and practice. So with that, I wanted to just um, give a little context for um, our work and then turn it over to Lisa, our host, to really drive things forward. So as uh, Pamela mentioned, this idea of how do you look at a variety of sectors for answers? How do you think about breaking down silos and disciplines? We're really at the crux of our work within our department. When we think about what it takes to develop leaders who are critically questioning not only what is sort of the orthodoxy, but how do you take really simple answers and turn them into critical questions is really the goal of what we do in this program. Right, in our department, we do that in a few ways. We have programs that are in ed leadership and policy studies. We do that in higher education administration, and we also do that in technology, ed communication technology. So ALT is really trying to figure out how do we develop cross-sector leaders and cross-disciplinary folks at NYU, consistent with what Pamela mentioned. To do that, we develop the Leadership Lens series, which is tonight. And that Leadership Lens series is a way to bring together leaders who are really talking about the really joys and the challenges of leading across a variety of sectors. And in education, we know that the solutions that are really being posed to communities really require critical analysis and real tension and discussion. So we said, well, let's bring some folks together who are doing that work in a variety of areas, and what are the lessons we can pull from it? So, in addition to tonight, we've had guests who've uh, come through, and I want to give a little background. We, we've had, um, in the past year or so, we've had the, uh, we have Cornell Brooks, the former president and CEO of the NAACP, uh, come and speak with us. We've had uh, Nina Diaz, the president, now president, of programming and development at Viacom. All right, one of the first Latinas to take a significant role, talking about her leadership journey as a New Yorker and as a Latina. We've had Craig Stephen Wilder, MIT historian, who is now writing and speaking around the world about the connection between higher education and the institution of slavery, and looking at, particularly at Ivy League universities. Really powerful work, and is behind much of the work in Georgetown, if you've heard um, that work. So, um, Craig has been a guest with us through this discussion. Tony Marks, President and CEO of the New York Public Library. 40 million visitors a year. What does it take to move an institution? And Tony will say, the reason we can innovate is because we're not heavily regulated, right? We can do things, we can think creatively and outside the box. No one kept track of us because they thought we were just stacks of books. So he's doing the most to do around things around literacy and access to immigration uh, information and so on. So, example of that. We've had John King, former Secretary of Education and now President of Ed Trust. We've had Madeline Pumayega, 
the Chancellor of Florida College System, serving over 800,000 young adults in the state of Florida. And so later this month, we'll have Chancellor Carranza, Richard Carranza, head of New York City Public Schools. And then we're gonna have some fun too with music. Um, we also have the CEO and president of WBGO Jazz Radio, Amy Niles, and the acclaimed Afro-Cuban jazz musician, Elio Villafranca, to come and speak about leadership in the arts and leading institutions like WBGO in Newark. So a lot of fun. Hopefully you all can come back and visit. Um, and tonight, we're really focusing on a discussion with key leaders, and I want to be able to introduce them. And again, with their long bios, I'm going to do bullets. Hope that's OK. All right? All right. Um, first, want to introduce Anthony Carnavale. He is the director of the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce. He's a formidable researcher and leading voice in any policy discussion surrounding the relationship between education and labor. Next is Mildred Garcia, president of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, whose decades of experience in all capacities of higher education make her a leading policy and advocacy voice as we look to the changing role of higher education and the supports needed for underserved communities in the 21st century. And Jamie Marisotis, President, CEO of the Lumina Foundation, who is, a, who is leading movements across sectors to engage in and create post-secondary opportunity and accessibility for all. And if you haven't read his book, you will, right? I think that's a gift to you all. We're gonna be able to uh, get a copy of his book, which is am amazing and great read. And lastly, I want to introduce our brilliant host, L2 host, Lisette Nieves. Lisette is clinical professor here at NYU Steinhardt and our program director for the Ed Leadership and Policy Studies program. So please, a round of applause for our guest and host. Okay. Can you hear me? Wow, I, I feel like I'm going to do sports scores. It just feels <laughs> there's something about that. So first, I want to thank everybody who's here. And I would just love it by a show of hands. Can you raise your hands if you are running a nonprofit or um, supporting students and workforce in a nonprofit? Can you have quite a few of you? Great. Can you raise your hands if you're in higher ed administration? Right, quite a few of you. Great. Can you raise your hands if you're a student at NYU? Nice mix. Can you raise your hands if you're an alum and part of the NYU family or faculty? Great, thank you. Great. There we go. Yeah, there. <laughs> excellent. Great. That helps me a lot too, and I love seeing the, the diversity of folks who are in this room because it is an intersection of these groups that are really challenging these policy issues. I thank you. I did not say, can you raise your hands if you're members of the philanthropic community? And there are quite a few of you here, too. I see the little hands go, they're like, yeah, we're ready, we're ready. We know you're here, too, so that's great. So I'm going to start this conversation, and this is where I get to say, um, I don't know of anyone who's written a paper on workforce that doesn't quote at least almost all of you <laughs> at some point. Um, I had students in my graduate class kind of say, well, I just put Carnivale, 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 Carnivale <laughs> in my lit review. <laughs> then I have a group of students who say, well, I just put Marisotis, 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 and the Lumina Foundation for the most up-to-date information on how we're understanding higher ed trends. And for anyone who's interested in higher ed leadership, we have someone who has been a president three times, has broken every record you can imagine, a fellow Boricua, I just have to put that out there too. <laughs> and when we're talking about higher ed leadership, it's Millie Garcia, Millie Garcia, Millie Garcia. So I just wanted to say that for all three of you. So thank you. All right, I get to kick us off. Jamie, I'm gonna start with you. Sure. Um, you use the phrase the ecosystem, thinking about workforce, right? So kind of, kind of set the stage for us. What do you mean by the, weco uh, the ecosystem? And help me describe the current state of education today. What are we seeing in higher ed? Talk to me about that. So look, there's a, um, we're at an interesting inflection point in our, in our history. Uh, there's a rising demand for talent that we simply cannot meet. And you can see the indicators of that rising demand for talent 
in the data that Tony produced uh, during the recession, which showed that things like wages and employment continued to grow even during the recession. Mm -hmm. And since the recession ended, uh, your ability to actually be a part of the middle class has been highly tied to whether or not you actually have talent that's developed in post high school learning context. You can see it in terms of the ways in which uh, we as a nation and, and more broadly as a global society are being challenged by ignorance that's being reflected in things like challenges to our democracy, challenges to our sense of shared prosperity and fairness. All of these things are terribly important. So, so talent is, I think, the signature issue of our time, maybe talent and climate change mm. are the two signature issues of, right. of, of our time. Mm -hmm. And our ability to actually develop and deploy that talent, I think, will be critical to our shared success. What we used to do was we had a very sort of simple linear model. You'd go to school. For most people, that was K-12 was good enough. And then an elite group went to college. And society was able to sort of tap that talent for the rest of your life. Uh, and we were able to become a very productive society economically and socially. It's, I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room that the education system of this country has been part of the American story, part of the success of, of, of we, what we call uh, the American dream. Uh, but uh, the world changed. And it changed in a lot of different ways. Uh, work has changed. The nature of work has fundamentally changed. Uh, as I said, your ability to be a part of the middle class without a higher level of talent, which I define as knowledge, skills, and abilities developed in high quality learning contexts and honed through things like experience in ways that benefit not only the individual, but all of us as a society. Your ability to do that is going to increasingly be uh, driven by, the f by whether or not you have the talent and whether or not you can demonstrate you have the talent with a credential that actually shows that you've got high quality learning. Now, the way that we are learning today is in an expanded ecosystem. Uh, for much of the 20th century into the 21st century, I think there was largely a, a monopoly uh, mm -hmm. of the education uh, providers, the colleges and universities and the K-12 schools. But now high quality learning is available in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. We recognize, or we've come to recognize, maybe it was there before, but we've come to recognize that high quality learning takes place in the military, mm -hmm. in, in work, uh, in workforce programs, in direct to consumer technology mediated contexts in lots of different ways. So the ecosystem of post-secondary learning is changing as the ecosystem of work is changing. And what's interesting about this intersection between learning and work is that we're fundamentally destroying that temporal model, mm. right? First you learn, then you work. Mm -hmm. Today, what we are, need to be talking about is a model where you are, for all of your adult life, a learner worker or a mm -hmm. worker learner. Now, a uh, quick pause here. Those of us who've been in the space for as long as the three of us have. Be uh, careful. Uh, <laughs> well, we're, we're, we, have a, we have a shared experience. Uh, um, uh, have for a long time called this lifelong learning. And, and I've come to the conclusion that lifelong learning is the wrong, wrong way to describe it. Lifelong learning, first of all, the problem with lifelong learning is that it, it doesn't sound terrible. Oh my God, I'm never gonna stop doing it. I just have to keep doing it for my whole life. But the other problem with that is that lifelong learning is really from the perspective of the providers. It's not from the perspective mm -hmm. of the people who matter most, those learner workers. So this ecosystem is really a different thing than what we've seen before. The ecosystem fundamentally has the wor learner workers at the center and lots of different players as part of that ecosystem. Certainly colleges and universities are a very important part of that ecosystem and will continue to, to do so for the, for the foreseeable future. Again, if you look at the data on outcomes and the benefits of, of, of post-secondary learning, the benefits accrue highest to people with degrees compared to, to, to mm -hmm. others. But the gap is narrowing, and employers mm. are beginning to recognize that what you know and can do, if you can demonstrate that by having a high quality credential, whether it's a certificate, a certification, a badge, a license, a degree, whatever it may be, that's what matters most uh, in the workplace. And um, that's what also matters most in life. I mean, I think what we've come to appreciate now is that those credentials are not just an indicator that you can do well in work. They're, they're, a, they're an indicator that you can do well in life. Because all of those things that you need to do well at in work, you also have to do well at in life. 
You have to be a critical thinker and a problem solver and a communicator. You actually have to know something about content. You know, those are the two things that we've long said are a part of, of the, the learning process. And today I would add a, a third element, and it's sort of the, the work that I'm starting to think about now in my own, um, uh, my own reflections and some new writing that I'm doing, which is that the new thing that we need to think about in terms of credentials is not just preparing people with those generalizable skills and preparing them with content knowledge, you know, chemistry, graphic design, English, whatever it may be. We also have to prepare them for human work because in uh, a world where automation and AI and smart machines are driving what we increasingly do as a society, our ability to um, learn as humans and work as humans is going to what's be what distinguishes us from the machines. So that means that we've got to think about these credentials mm -hmm. now as conveying those human traits, empathy, caring, understanding, those kinds of, of things. And so I'm increasingly thinking about how we, from a learning perspective, that's what Lumina Foundation does, we're focused exclusively on post high school learning, how from a learning perspective, we can think about these credentials as conveying the generalizable skills that help make you successful in work and life, the content knowledge, but also those human traits that will define who we are as, as humans going forward. I want to make sure we get through everyone here too, but I, I want to push you on one thing on that, Jamie. And, and I'm seeing Millie giving me the eye, and I know she's, we're, we're going to be on the same track on this one, which is, what about the question of equity mm -hmm. and quality, right? Because when we're talking about credentials, right, who's getting the best return on investment? Right. Who's being left out? Who's saying what's quality or not? There's, there have been some predatory examples of that too, and so I'm just, yeah. I'm curious to hear, and, and anyone can chime in on that, but I, I, I yeah, let's, we can't. Let's tag team on this because, I, you know, look, I, yeah. I want to say one thing about equity. You can't do any of that without equity being at the center, mm -hmm. period. Uh, it has to be the core of the, of the learning system. And part of the uh, challenge that I've had being in the space for, for three decades is yeah. that equity's always been a nice to have, not a gotta have. Yeah. And my view yeah. is equity, equity is the work. Right? Equity is fundamental to whether or not we use the learning system to give people the talent, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need to be successful in working in life. And if you only do that for one segment of the population, you fundamentally are not actually a learning enterprise. So equity has got to be core, core to that work. My, my own argument, the argument at, at Lumina Foundation is that there's lots of different dimensions of equity that are very important, right? Uh, LGBT, uh, adults a first generation, low income. But right now in our history, we think the most important element of equity is race and ethnicity. They are the defining issues that, 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 uh, that define the divides that we have in society more clearly than anything else. Again, not to say that any of those other things aren't important. We just believe that right now, race and ethnicity are the things that are the greatest divides. And so at Lumina, it's where we're putting the greatest amount of our mm -hmm. energy to say mm -hmm. reducing gaps in, in equity by race and ethnicity has to be fundamental to the work going forward. Thank you. Millie, please. So I just wanted to add, I think when Jamie was talking about higher education, at one point, they left out the low income, the first gen, the students of color. Mm. And what has happened to our demographics, and Tony can talk a lot about that, is they were, we weren't the large majority. They let some of us in. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that, the American dream was not there. And now the demographics has changed. And as you look at leadership across the country, and if you really want to educate the populace of the United States and the vitality of this country to have the skills and talents, to be able to lift not only their families but this country, we have to educate the low income, the people of color, the first gen, in order for them to succeed, not only for their generations but those after them, but also the country, because we won't be having the talent. And so I think this is a real, that's the change, that it is an urgent call for us to be paying attention to the workforce and who are we as Americans and who does that represent? Millie, and, and thinking on that and following up, so what should senior education leaders be doing, right? You, you're in the leadership business, right? That's what you're doing right now. 
Who is getting it? So it's interesting. And what's missing? It's interesting. Uh, ASCII, which is the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, we do prepare people who want to be senior leaders in higher education. At one point, we talked a lot about access, and then it was retention, and then it was graduation. Yeah. But now it's about what is the responsibility of an institution to help that student get that first career entree? May that be getting a position mm -hmm. or going to graduate school? What do we do? What is our responsibility? Because the, the study that just came out talked about the underemployed. That first job out of that, after that degree is extremely important. So for us, when we talk now to potential presidents and we talk to people who are thinking about being presidents or the new president's academy that we run, we talk about, do you understand your students in their space? Do you understand what communities they come from? Do you help them understand the vast array of opportunities that they have? I have a nephew right now, for example, who is just going to college, young man of color. He doesn't know what he's gonna do when he graduates from high school. He doesn't understand the options. He hasn't had, and here's someone, he could come to Titi all the time. is the one they always come to, to talk this through. But what happens if those people don't have a Titi or don't have a mom and a dad? where they have to understand. And so what is our responsibility? And you know, we do have some institutions out there, and you know, I, I always say things come back in different forms. When I was at LaGuardia Community College teaching, they were talking about the world of work. And they were talking about what were the options, and I know Gutman is doing that as well. And I know the University of Wisconsin Stout. But as a higher ed community, we haven't done the intentionality and the execution to ensure that our students understand what is the potential, what are the possibilities. Stop listening to mom and dad that you have to be a lawyer, doctor, or nurse, but that there are other things out there for you. And what are we doing as leaders to be learning communities with our faculty and staff, to understand the communities from where they come, to help those students get an internship and experience where they are paid in order to understand what they will do after graduation. Okay, how are we doing? <laughs> All right, we haven't even gotten to Tony yet. Um, Am I talking too long? No, it's oh. great. No, oh, no. no, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think these are, no, and I think both of the points are, are so provocative for everyone in this room because it's important, right? In the field of education too, what does educational leadership mean in general? This is a K-12 discussion too. What is mm -hmm. the ecosystem? Mm -hmm that is supporting that, right? So you could look at these at different levels, these kinds of questions, so, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you also, Jamie, for saying equity is the work. It's not a description, it's a process. It's an action, so thank you for that. Tony, other than being cited in the majority of lit reviews on this topic. <laughs> Including Lumina Foundation papers. <laughs> One of your biggest um, reports was the separate and unequal. You talked a bit about the students, from the students' experience, where are they going? And then you went on to talk about students and work. Can you unpack those reports a little bit for folks here? Well, to tie that to the equity question, mm -hmm. which for me, the word equity, it always troubles me. I deal with lots of boards and leadership institutions um, in which the board is always happy to make equity a priority, but refuse to talk about race and class justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. equity in America, I think, has become uh, something of a term that allows us not to talk about things that we really mean when we talk about equity. Anyway, uh, the, uh, so I have this thing about equity uh, <laughs> as a term. <laughs> The American system uh, has always been brutally efficient uh, in that it has always placed its bets in education and everywhere else uh, on the people who were most, uh, where the returns would be the highest, and that has always been the most privileged people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Our system uh, has been in many ways, if you talk to uh, people, economists from other countries, they understand this. They think we're s somewhat uncivilized. Um, 
there, is, there are retorts for them as well, but I won't go into that here. But in the end, uh, what we've always done is we've placed the next dollar in education and pretty much everything else on the person who's most likely to pay off. That person uh, in American history has from the very beginning uh, began, uh, been a uh, propertied white male. Uh, and our history is really the story of the movement away from that as a legitimate idea in several respects. And people uh, have come to me and others for years saying, well, what does that cost? Well, it costs a lot. That is, you don't get the economic returns from the people who are left out, especially in a modern economy where education is very important. But if you total up the cost of bringing those people in fully, uh, there's a very famous prize-winning economist named James Heckman, who in the Clinton era, and I was part of that administration, we were all challenged, uh, because Heckman released an article that said, in order to take us back to the income distribution we had in 1979, and that was, uh, 1979 was the last year when America was most equal. Uh, after 1983, there was a recession in 80, 81, uh, beginning in 83, we began, began to get more and more inequality. 70%, David Oder's number and Larry Katz, not mine, 70% uh, of that increase in inequality has been due to differences in access to post-secondary education and training with labor market value. Mm -hmm. I quickly add that under the tail end. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the way we ran this system was very efficient. Uh, we put the money down where the payoff is going to be, and we visited the costs of failure on the populations we didn't invest in. And we continue to do that. Now, those populations, I think in the end, equity is a political question, which is why it's so hard to talk about. It is true that if you look at the data going forward, it's going to be hard for us to continue doing that because we simply won't be a white male or a white society much past 2040. Mm -hmm. The labor force turns, I think, in our numbers and others in 2042 mm -hmm. to majority minority. So, uh, but that just means, let's talk about the overall economy. Uh, and what we've seen is in that system, uh, it worked for a long time. Um, Europeans and others, because of their history, were forced after World War II to invest in the working class. They had real fascists and real communists uh, that they were afraid of. Uh, we may have them now as well emerging. But in the end, um, uh, that's the story of the American system, and I think we won't get equity. And equity now has become tied irrevocably to access to post-secondary education and training with labor market value, if you want to think in economic terms. It has also been tied more and more uh, to uh, basic uh, issues around the operations of our republic. That is, we know and can prove uh, that if you want to push back on the development of authoritarian personalities, that post-secondary education Literally in the data, which is somewhat surprising to me to found this out, because it's one of those things you always suppose is true, and then you look and it actually is. It's always a surprise. <laughs> so uh, we have a lot at stake here. Uh, and my, my sense is this is not, the economics of it are very simple and very straightforward. We've come to a point where, I'll give you two pieces of data, then I'll stop. Uh, in, 19, in the 1970s, uh, in the United States, uh, young people graduate from high school at age 18. Uh, only a small share of them needed anything after high school. Uh, and what happened is by age 25 at the median, both men and women would achieve the median hourly wage or annual wage uh, for their gender. Now sociologists and some economists use that as a measure of coming of age, that is, what the sociologists would say is once you hit that age at which you reach the median average, the median earnings for your gender, you are ready for, you are independent as an adult, and you are ready for family formation. Um, 
that age has changed. It's moved from age for young for new generations from age 25 to age 32 to 34, uh, an interval. And many Americans don't make it, uh, and it is minority and working class Americans and lower income Americans who don't make it, or make it and continually fall back over the line, yeah. over their lives and their careers. So. Uh, I think in the end, that's a political question, not an economic question. Uh, and the, the answer is certainly in part uh, that all these people, they don't just need education, by the way. They need uh, meaningful work experience. Uh, they need education that ties to that. Uh, they need a variety of supports uh, that allow them to be successful workers and successful citizens. Uh, education, I think, to close, uh, is the obvious solution in part because it's the one thing we all agree on. So even if it wasn't true that education was the solution, we'd all believe that because we're Americans and we trust education in a way we don't trust the government. We don't want the government to redistribute income. And it so happens that in a modern economy, education largely determines a person's economic prospects and social prospects as well. So it kind of worked out for us. We have a mechanism that we all agree to, pretty much across the board, bipartisan, that preserves individual responsibility. You gotta get your own grades, pass the test, go to the college, get the good job, and live happily ever after. So I think the answer going forward will be education. What shape that takes, I have no idea. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I totally agree with Tony, and one of the other things is, you know, when we look at all these studies, and I keep going back to the Stanford study by Chetty that yeah. talked about the social engines and who are they. They are the state colleges and universities that are moving low-income students from one socioeconomic status to another. I mean, there is evidence that is showing that there is a return on investment that the, these individuals that are going, not only moving up the social economic ladder, they're also having the social capital skills in order to survive. And so I agree with Tony that it is about education and this false narrative that we're hearing these days that college isn't for everybody, that higher learning isn't for everybody is a dangerous statement. And it is up, up to us as ed higher ed leaders to begin to talk about what does the study show? What have we seen in this country? And how do we move our populace through the educational process in the many different ways it's going to be? It's not gonna be the same way. You know, Jamie, and it, it brings me to you because I think it's interesting that you've also proposed and supported, even in your opening statement, that it's gonna look different, right? right? And it's not, it's not even probably gonna be called higher ed, right? You were talking about competencies. Right. What is stifling that innovation? And what can inspire that innovation? And, and are we seeing that connecting to higher ed too? Like this is, the, this is the other part, the either or, right? Is it the, you know, talk a little about that. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great question. There's, there's several things that sort of dampen it. Uh, one is um, the haves not wanting to give the have nots access to to, to the pie, so I mean that, that that's a reality. I think we're living that right now. Not to get into a political conversation, but I think I think that's where we are right now. Is that that, that there's pretty clear clear evidence of that. So I think I think that's one uh, one issue. I think another issue uh, that is stifling it is that government has never quite figured out how to regulate this enterprise of post high school learning in the right way. Mm. And so it's had a series of, I would describe them as well-intended efforts to try to protect consumers, but it's not always clear that those well-intended efforts have actually allowed the real innovation to take place that would literally be able to serve more people better, right? That should be the goal. The goal of government should be a, to serve more people better, right? That, that is what our shared democratic system should be about. Um, and, you know, as someone who has studied uh, federal regulation in particular, let me tell you, it does a whole lot of other stuff, but it doesn't really focus on that all that much. Um, and you know, I think maybe another thing that is, that is um, stifling that is the status quo. Uh, it's the fear of the unknown. You know, part of what happened to us, and now I speak specifically to those of us who uh, consider themselves a part of higher education, is that we drank our own Kool-Aid, right? Uh, we essentially said, look, 
college has been the ticket to the American dream. And so we got to just keep doing what we've been doing because this has worked for much of the last uh, half century anyway. And um, I think the reality is that we're seeing signs, Cindy referenced this a little bit, that, that, that there's cracks in that system, that the system is not serving people well, that it's not serving all the people well, and that, to your question from earlier, that there are real concerns about quality and what these credentials actually mean in terms of real and relevant learning. So, you know, I come back to the point here that the most important thing is this ecosystem where all of these actors are playing a role in serving the worker learner in a sort of ratcheting effect where you're working and you're learning and you're gaining more skills and the, and the indicator of that is the credentials that you accumulate over the course of, of a working lifetime. And to me, uh, that's the system that we've got to move towards. We've got to break out, uh, break out of this system. But um, the status quo can be a very powerful force, Lizette. Mm -hmm. I think you, you know the, the story that in the, in the um, late 90s, I was working uh, in my, my old life as the uh, president mm -hmm. of the Institute for Higher Education Policy on higher education reform in Southern Africa. And one of the things that I learned working in, in South Africa was, so we were in South Africa in the late 90s, trying to help South Africa move in the post-apartheid environment towards a more equitable model of, of higher education. So, you know, uh, my background's in higher ed finance, that's where I started, so I said, okay, well, let's develop a new funding model, new funding mm -hmm. system, et cetera. They had a funding model for the public universities in, in South Africa that I described uh, to the chagrin of the minister as brilliantly racist, um, because it had all of these weights and mechanisms in it that ensured that the money went to the historically white institutions and never went to the historically black institutions. Ironically, by the way, it's actually based on the NCHEMS funding model here in the U.S. Hmm. Uh, and they, they manipulated it in, in, in a way that was, that was mm -hmm. brilliant uh, in, in, in an evil way. So uh, we went in and we said, well, here's the changes that you need to make. Here's what you need to do to fix the system. And you need to sort of implement it over this certain period of time so you don't create disruptions. Is it? You know who objected to the changes in the funding model? The historically black institutions. It was the devil they knew. They were so accustomed to getting such a small piece of the pie that they were afraid this new model was actually going to give them a smaller piece. And uh, so it took a rewriting of the entire structure of higher education in South Africa to get to a more equitable model. The funding piece wasn't going to do it. They literally had to re redo the entire structure. So it shows you the power, even under dire circumstances, of the mm -hmm. status quo and um, um, understanding what you have now and being afraid of the change that's possible. We can't be afraid of that change in higher education. We are the engines of social and economic progress in this country. We've got to participate in our own change. It's not only in our self-interest, it's in the interest of what our missions are all about, which is to serve people. Mm -hmm. Tony, you talked about race, race and class. Tell us the narrative of what we're seeing, particularly with young people of color and their engagement in the employment market? Well, that's the American system continues to work pretty much the same way. That is, uh, there is a queue, an opportunity queue in American society. There are, if you track the history of good jobs um, since uh, the 1980s, uh, what you find is, as everyone knows, a, co a collapse of good high school jobs. A lot of that was manufacturing, or at least yes. that's the storyline that comes with it. Uh, but it was more than that. Uh, it was also, that tends to be a very male narrative, by the way. There is a parallel female narrative in clerical jobs uh, and bookkeeping jobs and so on that never gets talked about, but it's equally powerful. Uh, there was a collapse uh, in high school educated work that gave people good jobs and good jobs. What I mean by that precisely, because there is no definition until we make up our own, uh, and that is a job that will pay you in today's dollars 35K up till age 40, 45K after age uh, uh, 45, and in that job range in the current economy, all those jobs together pay a median of about 55. Uh, so. Uh, we now live in a world in which 20% of the good jobs still go to high school graduates. 
uh, mostly male, 85% uh, male among high school graduates. And that's what's left of manufacturing, mm -hmm. construction, some parts of ag, utilities, transportation. Um, and then, and actually it's rising a little because construction's been coming back. So, and then you've got the middle school jobs, which they had the stuffing knocked out of them with a decline of manufacturing, but they actually have not declined in number. They've actually grown by about four million jobs. Middle school, I mean more than high school, less than a bachelor's degree. Now, they didn't grow uh, the way they should have, but they're still there. Uh, and then the huge increase is at the BA level. And historically, what's happened is whites made a massive shift from high school, middle skill, to BA. It's really stunning. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason is when you look at the underlying family income and SES data, they were set up for that. They were ready. They had one to two generations, mm -hmm. let's to use the stereotype, of good industrial jobs, which provided a point of leverage to move to the next step for their children. What's happened to African Americans is they've move substantially to the BA, they, in all the historical data, uh, they follow behind whites at a much slower pace and in a much smaller share. Uh, and they still hold, African Americans still hold a very substantial share of middle skill jobs, uh, middle wage jobs, uh, and arguably middle skill jobs. So uh, Latinos are a whole different story. Uh, Latinos now own the good jobs in the high school realm, uh, which sets up the counterproductive narrative about Latinos taking over good jobs from white guys. Uh, the other half of that is all the white guys left, but the ones who were left behind really were hurt. So, uh, and then Latinos have made movement in substantial ways in the middle skill, AA certificates, middle skill jobs with the, some college or mm -hmm. no college at all, and have made, at least in terms of the size of the, uh, the movement, uh, have moved into the BA, but they're not there yet. So you see them, one way to think about Latinos is they're stalled. Uh, African Americans are making very slow progress. You could argue, and some people look at this data, say stalled uh, over the past six or seven years. Uh, and then you see Latinos moving in into the bottom tiers and so on. In some ways, this makes a lot of people feel good. Uh, because this sounds like the American ethnic story, right? Uh, we don't really believe that everybody should, we believe that ultimately everybody should have equal opportunity, but we also believe that everybody should wait their turn. Mm -hmm. And so we have this model in our head where the Latinos are up and coming, African Americans should lead the charge among the non-white populations and the white people should go first. And that's exactly what's happening. But in both the case of African Americans and Latinos, uh, the, probably the, the describing data is often difficult. The word there is pretty much stalled uh, with some more positive signs among the African American population. Isn't, by the way, isn't the problem with that narrative, yeah. one of the problems with that narrative, that the nature of work is changing so rapidly that collectively our shared prosperity is being reduced by the fact that the African American attainment is not increasing fast enough and that at best right. the Latino attainment is stalled. So, so the gap is actually widening at a time when the nature of work is changing so rapidly. You know, this, this uh, narrative that we went through in the, in, in the last decade or so about low skill versus high skill jobs. The reality is they're all higher skill jobs. That's right. the reality of, the, of yes. the labor market today. Right. They're all higher. And so that's another one of those sort of false narratives about the fact that, well, you know, so Latinos will start with the low skill and then they'll move to the higher, and low, but everything's moving higher. And the Excellent. problem with the, with the narrative, I think, to your point, Tony, is that um, we're, we're leaving the populations that are fastest growing with the least opportunity at the time That's of it. the greatest need from a societal perspective. Yeah, and no, the data and shows very clearly that we don't make it by 42. And no. I agree Maybe. with you that that's the narrative that we have to wait our turn, but that's a very Anglo perspective, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Of course. And so here you have a population that is growing. I, I spent 11 years of my life in the state of California where the white population is the minority. And they do have that thought. 
process. And yet, the people that have to run that state, that need to be educated, are the people of color, color the African Americans and Latinos, right? And so it is a narrative, and that's what's creating the angst, right? Because now these individuals are becoming the majority. They are the people that are becoming the elected officials in the state legislature. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that are demanding, and yet we have this angst of what's going on. And so you're right, it's higher skills for everybody, but we have to change the narrative when we get into the majority as to it's everybody's turn. And how do we do that to help students get into those higher level learning? Because yeah. we're not doing that in our K-12. And, and if you look at California, they're more segregated than they've ever been. Yeah. I, I would add a piece on this that the narrative is also conveniently moved where people want. It's like the post, right? I had the opportunity to work with Wall Street for at least six years. And so that narrative internally of where people were supposed to be, there isn't a pipeline, they're not ready yet, was a completely different narrative when they thought about talent outside the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I, I want to put that there too, that there, this notion of race is very separate a discussion than from geography. But when we try to merge them, they don't want to have that conversation. So I'm just putting that there. Because I've heard the narrative get disrupted in a lot of different ways, right? And you see that narrative in higher ed. Yes. It's very sexy to bring in the international of color. But what are we doing to pay attention to the of color in our country? But there is in this, I must say, because some of this is, a lot of this is a very tense conversation. And that is that... Um, the last time that I think the answer here is political life. Yeah. Uh, I don't know any other way to get this done. <laughs> uh, so the, the, uh, in the end, the last time a candidate carried white working class, uh, African American and women votes was Robert Kennedy in 1968. And he carried it in the South as well as in Wisconsin and a couple other places. He's the last politician to have ever done that. So there is a populist fantasy here, which you see being debated mostly in the Democratic Party, but in another way in the Republican Party, that if we can unify uh, that coalition, that all this stuff will begin to move. But clearly we're not unifying that coalition because of separations by race. Um, and that is, uh, in the end, where we're stuck at the moment. So, I mean, I think the prospects for all this in the long term seem to me to be actually pretty good because at some point the demography takes over uh, and it's a matter of how patient you are and how many generations you want to lose and all that mm. uh, but i think the the political answer is really the only answer i also by the way don't think higher education will get this done i think this will come from outside higher education higher education has got a sweetheart deal they're not mm -hmm. going to give it up. I don't know why they would. <laughs> uh, why would somebody give up a sweetheart deal? I don't, just don't know. Uh, and that is higher education is locked into an internal competition and race for survival. Uh, that makes it very difficult for them to do other than what they're doing, which is to chase money and test scores. Uh, and to, in the end, uh, the solution will have to come from the outside. And the solution I see coming, and it's coming at a deliberate pace, and all of us have been part of it, is first we're going to get transparency, then we're going to get regulation. Mm -hmm. And how long that takes, I don't know. But I'd like to come back to the point that Jamie made about the status quo. It's also how we educate our faculty and our higher yes. ed leaders in thinking about what's happening in this country. You know, how many, how many people do we know? Of course, that never happens at NYU. How many people do we know that want to recreate themselves and their graduate students so that they do it exactly the same way and, and that they look at the world exactly the same way instead of letting people to, to learn how to be innovative and entrepreneurial and changing higher ed in the ways that we're thinking? We also have to take a responsibility in how we are preparing our faculty, our staff, and our leaders. We have a responsibility in that as well. 
Well, at, at this point, I want to turn to some questions that we got from the audience. We'll do a couple of those. Um, can everyone sense that this conversation could go on for a while, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm sure that we all have questions because I am leaving with more questions than answers. This came from an NYU faculty member. How do you ensure that career pathway programs aren't just for some and perceived as tracking for low-income students, right? Because this is definitely what's always been. You say, what props up higher ed to not innovate? It's to say, it's, we're not tracking, right? But so we are I, tracking. Well, I, yeah, well, this is, that's the flip side to it, right? But that question, anyone want to answer that? Well, let me take a shot at it. That is, in 1983, uh, we decided to end tracking in K-12 education sort of, uh, with the Nation at Risk report. Mm -hmm. And we decided then and have pretty much, uh, nothing is universal, especially in a locally controlled system, but we have pretty much moved the curriculum to what was called the new basics back then. And that's is still measured that way by NCES, uh, which is to say that we took the, what, 22 to 26 credits in high school and about 22 of them now are in general education subject matters. Uh, we basically banished voc ed, always snuck it in the back door, and then we created CTE, mm -hmm. uh, which is just bad voc ed. Uh, and then, so what we've got is a system that through the K-12 years really pretty much promises general education to all American youth. And tracking was a big part of that conversation. I mean, the, the, the Nation Risk Report talked about losing our uh, industrial supremacy and technology lead, and it was all about jobs, not about education. But the, uh, in the end, we've pretty much done that. That then leaves higher ed holding the bag. That is, higher ed by default is our career development system or workforce training system, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. Uh, now, there's a pushback on that. There are a lot of people who are saying that the change in K-12 was too much of a good thing. So you get a lot of pushback now on the Hill and elsewhere of people saying, we got to, Mike Pence, yeah. we mm -hmm. got to put uh, voc ed back into high school. Uh, and they have an argument that's not a bad argument because we're still graduating about 48% kids from high school who ultimately go nowhere. Within eight years, they don't have any post-secondary credential. So uh, they have an argument. So then the question uh, gets to be okay, and I, let me, I'll conclude to this, uh, I think when you f get a feel for the politics of this, my gut sense of where we're headed is this notion of 14 is the new 12, uh, which is that we're going to say every, because there'll be a lot of people that want free college, the, the Democrats are piling on on that one, um, and then there are a lot of, but you can't stand in front of a group, a room full of voters and say, uh, we're going to give everybody a college degree for free. You cannot do that because most of the people in the audience will say, my kid is worthy of a college degree and will be prepared for it, but those other kids are not, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, so what you're stuck with then is that you've got to stand in front of the crowd and say, because they want higher ed and it moves votes, uh, we're going to give more higher ed, but we're not going to give away the BA. Therefore... Any good politician, you cut the baby right in half. And um, what you say is, we'll give two more years after high school. What that look, we're gradually moving that way, I think, in a lot of different legislative streams. Uh, and that's what's coming. Question is, what is that? Uh, and I'm sure the way it will be written is 14 is the new 12 with no barriers to the BA. And what does that look like? Millie? Really? So. I'm going to go, now I'm moving into higher ed, right? I, I let Tony answer that and I agree with him. And I'm going to go from the local to the global. Because the truth of the matter is, where did the elites go? And they were no longer the majority. They are in a very special, they let in some low incomes. We hear the Ivies talking about, yes, we're going to let some in. But the majority of the students are in community colleges and state colleges and universities in this country. That's where they are. And so it is up to us being in the local, create, creating an intentionality that these career opportunities are for all the students that we serve. That when you're working with faculty on this Einstein thing that happened at Fullerton, that they worked with MIT and faculty that I can't explain, 
that you have the students that are low-income first generation and people of color in those labs with those students, that those opportunities before at our state colleges and universities and at community colleges went to the very few selected. Mm -hmm. And it is up to us to ensure that our students are getting the global opportunities we used to get to the very selected few. And so that's when you go into higher ed, that's what our responsibilities as leaders are, that we're paying attention to that kind of work that is happening on our campuses and that those opportunities are given to every single student that walks in through your door. You know, it's, um, but Millie, I think there's, there's a real challenge with that. Public higher ed, which you represent, mm -hmm. 30 years ago is different than today. Absolutely. Look at the City University right now. Mm -hmm. You can cut across the campuses which ones are going to have more first gen and Pell and which ones don't. We have mimicked a research environment that has done that. And, I, and so this question of access, which used to be assumed was public, you can look at places and say there really aren't the seats even in the four-year colleges to serve the demand. So, I, I'm, so here's what yeah, I would yeah. say to you. Leadership matters. Mm -hmm. yeah. The leader yeah. believes in that system mm -hmm. and has allowed the status quo or the, the reality yeah. to go into it. And I'm not criticizing anybody, I'm just saying a fact. Yeah. It, it is up, people have to say, have, you know, the Mexican Americans taught me wonderful words called tener las ganas, is having the guts, the real guts, mm -hmm. that if you really believe that there is an inequity going on in a system that you're in charge of, what are you doing about it? Mm. Yeah. Why aren't you speaking to the president? If you're a head of a system, and I could talk about the CSU, you're hiring 23 presidents. Right. What are their values? Who are, what, is, what is it that they want to do? Do they want to recreate the CSU into a UC? But maybe that's not the right president for you to be hiring. Mm -hmm. I hope this election panel for the next CUNY chancellor hears that. All right. <laughs> um, we're going to end with a question for you, for you Jamie. <clears throat> And so this one is, uh, came from a student in our Educational Leadership Politics and Advocacy Program, a master's student. And they asked, how do we incentivize the private sector to engage easy. in programs to think of talent broadly that immediately don't show them a return on investment? Yeah, you know, so uh, it's a wonderful question and it's the right question. So this is a little bit of a sort of analog to what Tony was talking about, mm -hmm. about the the political questions that are associated with the decisions that need to be made. I would argue, and I, I argued in, in the last book here, that we have not appropriately tapped the private sector here as a truly mm -hmm. effective participant in this system. Mm -hmm. um, the private sector, and by private sector I mean both private capital markets as well as business in the way mm -hmm. we might think of it today, uh, both have an enormous uh, potential to have a real difference in the space. From the business perspective, right, from the employer perspective, uh, they've got three reasons to, to, to engage. I call it the three C's, company, country, and community, right? Mm -hmm. They have um, not just an interest in uh, meeting their legal obligations to return maximum value to shareholders, but they also have a commitment, many of these com uh, companies, to the communities where they are and broadly to the effectiveness of American society. These, these uh, we're, we're now told that, that corporations are, are people too, so we want them to have human values like <laughs> empathy and caring and, and other things. And so, uh, so we should expect that of them. So, so the community and the company part, I think is really important. And I'll, you know, I'll give you a, uh, one example of this. In the K-12 space, we actually have seen businesses have an influence on the debate about K-12 reform, right? Like, yes, like you you've, you've mm -hmm. seen that, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, but it's not, an, it, we haven't seen that as much in, on, the, on the higher ed or post-secondary mm -hmm. post -secondary learning side. The private capital markets, though, is where we're putting a lot of our energy at Lumina because we believe that private capital markets, that th this interest in impact investing is real, and that private capital markets are trying to figure out how they can literally do well and do, do good uh, with uh, the resources they have. Now, you know, there's, 200 plus trillion dollars in private capital markets ac around the world. Um, so if we could deploy uh, one basis point, one one hundredth of one percent of the, of the amount of resources that are in private capital markets today, we could have a greater influence in what the federal government spends on higher education in the United States today. 
So tapping that capital for good is hugely important, but we need mechanisms to do that. We need social innovation bonds. We need mechanisms that are gonna create connections among the investors, the service providers, and whoever the guarantors might be. It might be us in philanthropy, it might be, it might be government, it might, might be somebody else. We need to fi find ways in which we can uh, tap the, the interests of, of those in the private capital markets who are starting to do this in other areas like climate change, but haven't figured out how to do this in the case of, of talent. And so that I'm, we're very interested in that work at Lumina yeah. and, and we're one, one foundation that's trying to, to work in that space very concretely by actually doing a lot more in impact investing. And the state colleges and universities are recognizing that. Yeah. They're realizing that it's, it has to be a partnership yeah. with the private sector. You know, just a really simple example. We have a multi-million dollar donor at Cal State Fullerton. And we were trying to tell him, and he's part of the Orange County community, not a graduate of Fullerton. We went to talk to him. We talked to him about our students. We brought students with us. He went back to his firm. 40% of his employees were Cal State Fullerton employees, well, graduates. He didn't know that. Mm -hmm. he didn't, his CFO was a Cal State Fullerton mm -hmm. graduate. And he realized, oh my God, the potential, right? right? Oh my God, this is my workforce. Oh my God, this is the people that are helping me with this multi-million dollar business. And as presidents and as leaders, we have to start thinking about the incubators and thinking about how do we do that within our communities and how do we bring in the local businesses that need the talent that we're graduating. Yeah. So one final point about that, and that is institutions are very important uh, in a number of respects, but we have lived through a revolution, uh, arguably variously called the third industrial revolution, the knowledge economy, and so on. And largely it was the development of network systems in the private sector, beginning in manufacturing, spreading to services, and then with Al Gore into government, he hoped. Uh, and we're seeing that fight now in education and in healthcare. Yes. Uh, and uh, what that means from an educator's perspective, especially at the post-secondary level, is that in economic terms, the institution matters less and less and less and less. And what matters more and more and more and more in terms of economic value is the program, not the institution. So institutional effects, they're real. If you go to Harvard, you will do better uh, than somebody who goes to a much less prestigious institution. Uh, but that is a, actually a fairly rare uh, in terms of the entire system. That's a fairly rare effect. Uh, so anyway, I mean, what uh, we're, when I talk about transparency, and this is where all the movement on transparency, and it is bipartisan, is moving, is that is they want some institutional outcome standards. Cost is key, uh, graduation rates, time to graduation, things like that. But the guts of it is performance by program um, in, on employment and earnings. That's where it mm -hmm. steps beyond support from mm -hmm. the higher education community. Mm -hmm. That is the thing that Terry Hartle, for you, those of you who know him, will never agree to. Uh, so, you know, there is, a, uh, there is a gradual shift going on here that I think higher education doesn't see, uh, which is program level information is really what matters now. Institute, for an economic point of view, there, it in some ways complicates and obfuscates the larger questions about the purpose of higher education, and I don't have quick resolutions for that. So the degree matters, the institution matters, the overall structure of the values in the college and all that matters, but in economic terms, it doesn't. You know, and Tony, I mostly agree with you 99.9% .9 of the time. This is that 0.1% of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I do see, particularly from for the perspective of students of color, Thank the you. price they pay mm -hmm. by going off brand. I see that. I see that in their employment gains. I see that where they go to school. I see that in the choices they're making, right? I see how they have been engulfed in the for-profit predatory environment because they were going after program. If we could talk about program, but not talk about quality, it's, it, 
doesn't help me. I'm just, I'm just pushing you on that. Well, in bit. the end, from an economic point of view, quality is a very, very simple thing uh, that's easily measured with no debates, and that is... Yeah, that's where the economists and I differ. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you get a job? There are three metrics, and there two of them are currently available. Did you get a job? How much money did you make? And then you can fool around with gainful yeah. employment metrics about I, whether or not it was worth the money relative to the wages, repayment, all so, the rest of that. And the third thing is, are you working in your field? Now, for half of college graduates, working in your field is not that important. For half, it is very important uh, and, and confers a huge earning advantage. So if you're graduating from a program that promises you you'll be a lawyer, and you never get to be a lawyer, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah. So there is, I mean, one of the nice things about economics is it's a very simple-minded view of the world. You don't have to be really <laughs> smart to be an economist or thoughtful, uh, but it is, one, it is the reason why we end up measuring everything with money. Yeah. Because it's the one fungible. There's always this debate about what's the common currency in higher education. The common currency in higher education is the currency. Yeah. How much money do you make? Yeah. So I know that we have to wrap up, and I want to do a couple of things. First, can we thank this great panel? That's it. <laughs> We're going to talk about this, Tony. We're going yes. to keep this going because there's, there's a lot more. I to know go we, will. Yeah. we will. We will. <laughs> we will. All you have to do is look at Latina academic outcomes Hello. and where they work mm -hmm. and what they're paid. Yeah. Yep. And it skews that logic. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, did I say that? Yes. Yes, All yes right. you can. Okay. I, I, the 100%. Thing, 100%. The second thing I want to say is this is an Oprah moment. All of you get a book from Jamie Marisotas. <laughs> it's a happy day. <laughs> So thank you, Jamie, for doing that. And this is a chance to actually meet the panelists, so please come up and introduce yourselves, and thank you for being here on behalf of NYU, the Department of ALT, and great par partnership with our lead sponsor, Edwin Gould Foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.